I want to start with this image. This is actually one of the places where I work. This is actually Stanford University's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, CCRMA, uh, and that's pronounced Karma. And this is kind of a nexus of uh, computer science, electrical engineering, psychology, cognition, uh, design, all in the service of music and what music can do for people. And okay, actually, I'm just, can I just project? Yeah, just better. Can you guys hear me? All right. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, they say that you know your your day job is the one that you you do, and, and your night job is the one that you, you, you it's what you really love doing. Um, I think in that sense, I'm very fortunate to not actually have a day job, and I have two night jobs. Um, one is at Stanford doing research and teaching in computer music. The other is very related. Um, working with Smule to actually build social mobile musical things for a lot of people. Um, and I want to tell you kind of my, a little bit of my story about this and uh, maybe this is where I'll start. Um, I was born in Beijing in 1977. I grew up with my grandparents as did many of my, uh, my generation. Um, and. Uh, I grew up in a household filled with music. Um, my grandmother has loved Beijing opera since she was like six years old. Um, today she is 93. And uh, she knows every, every Beijing opera, like every part of any Beijing opera ever written, song, played. She plays the Arhu. She knows how to sing all of it. Um, and uh, she's. So one side of the house was filled with Beijing opera. The other side, and by house, I mean a very small apartment in the middle of, of Beijing. Xuan um, Woman, actually, that's where we live. And, uh, and, and the other side of the, the apartment is uh, my, my grandfather with his Western classical music. He was an avid lover of music. And um, in, he actually had a lot of records uh, that he brought back from his travels abroad. Uh, those were completely and utterly destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. So for in the late 70s, he had like no recorded music that he could listen to, the music that he loved. But in the 80s, China started having this radio station uh, that broadcasted classical music. And my grandfather started recording it. And by the mid-80s, he actually has about a collection, which is still now in, in our apartment, of a bookshelf of 660 cassettes carefully cataloged into two rather thick notebooks. And, uh, and this is kind of his random access music library. If he wants to listen to the Classical Symphony by Prokofiev, he'll, he might find that it's on cassette number 400, side B, about halfway. And this is, this is like his iTunes library for their iTunes. Um, they also got me my first instrument. Uh, for some reason, they decided to give me an accordion when I was seven. This is not the really the instrument of choice, so to speak. Um, traditionally speaking, you either, you know, I guess statistically, if you're going to have your child play a musical instrument growing up in China, it'd probably be like a piano, or a violin, or maybe like a traditional Chinese instrument, like an arhu or something like that. No, they're like, hey, here's an accordion. Go go see if you like playing this. And every week, uh, I mean, the accordion was actually bigger than I was. But my grandfather, every week, uh, took the accordion, put it on a cart, and we'd get on a bus and go to Xidan. And actually, that's where the lesson was. And I was in a room full of 30 other you know, seven-year-olds with accordions. Um, by the way, this is not somewhere you'd really want to be, actually, as a listener. Because this, this is like 30 young, budding accordionists, but they are still learning the accordion. At any rate, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and, uh, it, but it wasn't until I think later that I realized how much I loved music. My, my grandparents never pushed me to actually learn one thing or the other. They kind of always wanted me just to discover. Um, and, uh, and at the age of nine, I actually moved here to the US uh, to be with my parents. My dad was doing his PhD at Georgia Tech. Um, he had came over in 1985 and I in 1986. Um, and uh, for my 13th birthday, they did something that I realized in hindsight was truly 
different. Um, they bought me on, I, I think it was, they decided to get me an electric guitar for my birthday. And uh, now this may seem like it's kind of a you know normal thing maybe, but uh, I guess if you have or are a Chinese parent um, or know of Chinese parents, this is, this is kind of a rather unusual thing to do. My dad even converted our family stereo into an amplifier because we, I mean, this is, we were not wealthy and he put a quarter inch jack at the back of our uh, stereo and uh, said, hey, you know, hey, son, you can amplify through this. And I said, oh, that sounds great. And it's right around that time that I truly discovered how much I loved music, but also how much I loved playing music. Um, and I also thought it was kind of interesting in that I thought it was kind of smart on my parents' part. Um, I think to preemptively buy and give your kid the very instrument of rebellion, the electric guitar, you're sanctioning it. And by sanctioning it, you've just taken all the fun out of rebelling. <laughs> and and I, as a kid, I never felt the need to actually to really rebel. The concept is actually, I, mean, I, I grew up nine years in China and the rest, I grew up my teenage years here. Um, you know, my parents, you know, had plenty of discussions about grades and things like that, but I never, I, I, to this day, I'm very close to my parents and I'm, I think, deeply grateful for the fact that they did not push me to do what they think I wanted to do, but rather to push me simply to find what I want to do and then to push me to take that to the next level. Um, but they were so open to kind of what I was doing. And when I say when I love music, you know, after I've been playing guitar for a couple of years and probably driving them out of their, out of their minds with heavy metal and a lot of other music I was playing, um, they continued to support it and said, hey, if you love music so much, here's, here's some things you can do that would, also, that would also allow you to be creative, but also maybe make a living more easily. And so they suggested maybe also looking into kind of engineering. And that's actually what it ended up doing. Um, so I went to Duke for undergrad, studied computer science. I went to Princeton for grad school. Um, I was in computer science, but I was studying computer music. And that time I just realized, wow, it's actually, um, it's actually possible to combine these two things that I enjoy doing so much, building things with computers, but also making music. These are just two wonderful joys. Um, and uh, in, in 2008 or 2007, uh, I graduated and uh, went to Stanford. Um, in 2008, that's when Samuel was started. So that was kind of pretty much that's, that's my entire life so far. And, uh, um, and the thing I'll say about it all is that I don't really know what I'm doing. In fact, uh, I, all, all I know is I really like doing it. Um, and I think I've, again, I think I've got to thank my parents and my grandparents for, for not being afraid to say, I don't know what my, what my, what my child's going to do, but I'm going to try to help him find it, and hopefully he'll love what he does. Um, this apparently is what the New York Times thinks I'm doing, um, which is getting all these people to take their instruments and go onto the street and make music. Um, in some symbolic conceptual level, this is exactly what I'm wanting to do. Um, except it's not with traditional instruments, because I think I recognize that, hey, uh, you can't just put like a violin in front of someone who doesn't play it and say, one, two, three, be creative, go. It doesn't really work like that. Um, but yet, at the same time, there is this undeniable joy in making music that I feel a lot of people go through life never quite experiencing. So where does that meet? And where that met for me was with computers. So I found there's a way through computers that we can really set the conditions right to get people to be expressive, be creative, to have fun. And in the process, almost discover the joy, that very joy of making music, maybe even by accident. Um, and so that's, that's mainly what I want to talk to you today about. Um, but I'm going to go back in time once again and uh, show you this quote here. Some of you might recognize this. I'll just go ahead and read this. It's 
kind of nerdy actually, supporting for, supposing for instance that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds and the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. What this is actually saying is, is not as, almost not as important as who said it and when it was said. Huh? Cage, good guess, but actually uh, even earlier than Cage. Anyone know this quote? Very good guess. Huh? Carl Ives? Ives, no, keep thinking like earlier. Predates Cage and Ives by uh, about 100 years, actually. Ada Lovelace, Lady Lovelace, working with Charles Babbage on the analytical engine. This is, a compu this is probably, at least conceptually, the first computer that mankind has known. It was never really built, but in theory, it had all the constructs of uh, what we think of as a computer today. And she essentially said, hey, we can make computer music. And, uh, and by the way, Ada says, you know, this is also what a computer is, because I'm just inventing it now. And uh, you know, she was, of course, commonly regarded as maybe perhaps the world's first computer programmer. Um, fast forwarding a little bit, <laughs> people, once there were actual computers, for example, around the middle of the 20th century, people start, really did start experimenting with them. Um, Max Matthews, often cited as the grandfather of computer music and perhaps the first true computer musician, started working with, uh, with, with computers for music and sound in, in the 1950s. Uh, this actually is a little bit later. This is an IBM 360. You can kind of see that this is actually something that fills an entire room. I don't even know where the monitor is. I don't think there is one. Um, but what I hold in the palm of my hands right now is a several, several orders of magnitude more powerful more storage, more capabilities, and several, ma several, several orders of magnitude less expensive. And this is not more than probably 30, 40 years ago. So in terms of technology, the time scale is super compressed. And, um, and I think it's that, that rapid change that really enables us to explore very rapidly. And uh, um, but it certainly changes the equation on what we can do with this kind of thing. And I want to show you some examples. For that, um, moving forward a little bit more, uh, Princeton actually worked on or some rather nerdy computer music stuff. This is, a, this is a symbol for Chuck. It's a programming language for uh, generating sound and music. This became what we use in the laptop orchestra. This is actually what's running on every ocarina. Um, on every uh, you know, iPhone that has Chuck, uh, has Ocarina. So I'm just going to give you a quick nerdy demo. How many of you guys in this room program? I see like three hands. All oh, right. So do not worry. I think by the end, you, you will know how to Chuck, at least in, in, a, in, in the most important ways anyway. What I'm going to do here is actually I am going to uh, actually I'm gonna plug in the audio. I'm going to start writing a little program here and just follow along. Bear with me. I'm going to make a sine oscillator. We'll call this one Bob. This sine oscillator is going to generate a sine tone. I'm going to send this to DAC, which is the basically it's a re some representation for the speaker out. And this symbol right here just says connected. So it's as if I took a patch cable and took one and then plugged in the other one. All right. Um, and I'm going to set the frequency of Bob to, f not boo, but Bob to 440. That's in hertz. And in order to play this, this is actually a valid Chuck program, but we hear no sound. Um, and that's because Chuck is a language that deals with time. And by manipulating time, you're actually getting sound to compute. Let me show you. It's my secret goal to like to completely nerd out with all of y'all. So. Um, <laughs> If I do this and if everything works right, let's make sure. Oops. Two seconds, check two now. Well, that played two seconds of a sine wave at 440 hertz. That's not too bad. Even if you never wrote a line of code in your life, I bet this actually, you know, making sense, right? Uh, I'm going to just copy and paste that 
and I'm going to change this num these some numbers here so that we're actually going up by doubling the frequency, but we're really just going up by octaves. So every time you double the frequency, you go up by one octave. And I'm going to actually reduce the duration of each of these sounds, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and one second. Cool. So that's basically three successive A's. Let's put a little construct here where we actually automate it so that whatever this is will continue to repeat. That's this little while loop here, and whatever's in this block is going to keep repeating. All right, I, it's going to keep going, so I'm, I'm going to stop that there. I can't, really, I can't really prove to you that this is going to go on indefinitely, but trust me, it will. Um, instead of 220, let's go ahead and generate a random number between 30 and 1,000. Great, but let's do that a little faster. Instead of 0.5 seconds, let's go 100 milliseconds. What does that sound like? This, ladies and gentlemen, is what I commonly think of as the canonical computer music. <laughs> this is the sound that, in my mind, that mainframe computers are supposed to make when they're thinking real hard. <laughs> So, but let's keep going. In Chuck, you can actually talk about sound. See how fun programming is? Um, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Chuck, you can actually keep going down in time and really zoom in. So if we were to randomize the frequency of the sine wave 100 times a second rather than just 10, it's going to sound like this. It's like the computer version going blah, 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 blah. Um, 1,000 times a second. What does that sound like? That's a sine wave, but sounding very different than a sine wave. This is quite interesting from a perceptual point of view in that we somewhere sometime between uh, like listening to this like maybe you know ten times a second to a hundred to a thousand, we start hearing different structure. Here we hear one continuous carpet of sound. We stop hearing the individual transitions where the frequency change happens. And this is the same reason that movies work, is because right around the 20 to 30 times a second threshold, we stop perceiving things as actual events, but actually then as one continuum. And it's the same thing with sound. We actually, the same perception holds for sound as, as it does for movies. Um, and you can chucking do this crazy thing where every digital sample we're going to change the frequency randomly. Now, mind you, there are 44,100 samples per second for basically CD quality audio. If you do this, you get a truly interesting signal. It's not that interesting, but... There are two components there. There's a noise, and then there's a whistle. Listen for it. It's interesting. That whistle there is a very nearly the opposite of noise. It's a very structured, deterministic signal. But with Chuck, the idea is that you can really zoom into time and listen to things at that level. Let's go ahead and zoom back out. We saw a sample, there's one sample millisecond. There's this guy. You can change the frequency like randomly every minute, hour, day. Here we're getting to like really long time scale music. Like you probably wouldn't want to listen to this. Or if you did, you have to, you have to wait until the next day for it to hear something different. There's also, like this is, and I would basically stop with week in terms of like default durations you can have. Um, but beyond week, it seemed like a month was kind of tough because not all months are of the same length. Um, and uh, someone did suggest Fortnite is two weeks. Um, it's still a duration we can use. But in any case, that's Chuck. Um, and to give you another example, I'm going to actually write a little bit of Chuck code on the fly. So Chuck is a language that allows you also to quickly experiment with music and sound. So in this case, I'm just going to describe to you, don't worry about the stuff in green, everything else just means, hey, here's our sine wave. I'm going to have a, basically a grab bag of pitch classes I'm going to take out of this. And I'm going to basically randomly offset it into a particular red musical register and offset that in pitch within that register. So if we were to listen to this now, 
going to hear this one tone. It's because there's only one thing in here. We're not randomizing it. Let's go ahead and randomize. And every time you hear, you see this, this equal sign, that means I'm actually changing the code on the fly. So let's add a major second here, major third, and offset this a little bit more. Uh, let's keep going. So this is an idea to just quickly experiment perfect fifth. And make it a little faster. And add a little reverberation up here. And let's see, let's keep going. Seven, nine, major seventh. Drop this. So it's it's just it's a once you can do things and iterate and prototype that rapidly that fundamentally does change the way that we actually approach the act of actually creating music and creating sound. So anyway, this is the stuff that I worked on um, when I was at Princeton, still working on it now. Um, Chuck is actually open source and freely available. Um, I like to say it crashes equally well in all the operating systems that <laughs> you might run today. So have at it. Um, and by the way, uh, if you can follow along there, and I suspect all of you can, um, you, you can actually learn Chuck uh, pretty easily. Programming shouldn't be that hard, just like making music. It should be fun. Um, so then there's a laptop orchestra. Um, I was very fortunate to be part of the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, um, one of the, I guess, founding instructors of this thing. This was founded, actually, by uh, my advisor at Princeton, Perry Cook, and music professor Dan Truman to explore making music with computers um, as a group, but also to make music in a way that's both very kind of trying to use the cutting edge technology that we have today in computers, but also harking back to perhaps an older tradition, the chamber orchestra. Um, and the idea is that we actually have these special speakers. I don't know if you can see them, but these domes over here. Um, those are uh, hemispherical speaker arrays. And the idea is that, well, if you play like a violin or a cello, the sound naturally doesn't go through like a PA system. It comes from the thing itself. And you put groups of those acoustic instruments together, and you have a very kind of intimate way in which sound is actually conveyed to the audience. And that's why the chamber orchestra is such an important aspect here, is because there's a certain intimacy when you actually listen to a chamber orchestra, because you're usually in a smaller space and you can hear where all the, basically all the sounds are coming from. And there's this very three-dimensional, if you call it, image that's, that's projected. And it's the same idea, except with computers. Um, and uh, when I started at Stanford, uh, I brought the laptop orchestra idea over. And we have the Stanford laptop orchestra. The Princeton one's called Plork. The Stanford one is called Slork. Um, <laughs> And uh, we actually build our speakers out of IKEA salad bowls. Uh, a lot of do-it-yourself. So these are 11-inch Blanda mat uh, salad bowls. And uh, but rather than just showing you more pictures, I'm going to just play a little video and just some excerpts of what the laptop orchestra is like. Because you know it's like what in the world is a laptop orchestra? These are several pieces done. This is one. All of these, most of these are student works. Here they're actually using a controller tied to their hands and in kind of this virtual handbell choir. And then they're going to switch in a different mode where they're actually bowing the air in front of them. Let's see. Moving forward a little bit. Here's a piece featuring a Wiimote. One's called Monk We See, Monk We Do. It has to do with chanting, it has to do with imitation, and it has a Wii mode in it. So, Monk We See, Monk We Do. It's, a, it's like a triple pun, it's horrible. Um, here's a piece called simply Barrel, in which we've actually made it an eight person harp out of this like metal oil drum. We basically duct tape. Um, these controllers where we can basically sense position, but eight of them around the ring, 
and the conductor is standing on the barrel and conducting this piece. Uh, the barrel itself looks like some kind of a nuclear containment device that someone actually duct taped together. I don't know if that even makes sense, but actually it's a rather peaceful device. Uh, it's here to make music, not, not to blow up. Uh, but we haven't tried to get this through airport yet. Let me suspect that might be difficult. Um, let's see, moving forward a little bit more. This is a piece uh, called Converge that June Oh and myself did. We actually collected hundreds of images and sounds and location data through mobile phones. And here we're basically processing and visualizing them um, in kind of an exploration of time and memory. Here's an air band. Nick is playing air harp right there. Imagine invisible strings that he's actually plucking. Of course, this is detected by the same controller on his hand. And Charlie here is playing a, uh, a bass by, by plucking this string. And it's a certain undeniable charm and magic, I think, when, to things when we can't quite figure out what is going on there. And, uh, <laughs> And who hasn't wanted to play, you know, the air drum? Here's Adam. <laughs> and uh, so, this is an experimental headbang orchestra. <laughs> we have sensors attached to the heads of these performers and sensing when they're headbanging. And when you shake your head, it also changes the sound. When you move your head, it's the whammy bar. Like that. Let's see, it's moving forward a bit. Um, this is a piece called Tweet Dreams, as in Tweet Dreams are made of these. Uh, it's a piece based on lifetime Twitter feed. And the audience, in fact, can participate and is encouraged to do so here. They're just tweet with special hashtags that gets picked up and it becomes part of the piece right then and there. And for the more classical, but computer-loving classical fan, I guess. A little bit of Bach. And here the laptop's used as a more of a physical artifact. This is actually the back of Karma. Um, it's kind of like masterpiece theater or something like that. Um, let's see. We've made pieces out of video games. This is using the Quake 3 engine. And all the players are these lizards running around shooting each other, but with sound. Um, it's a piece by Robert Hamilton. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And uh, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, so, I think all this bears asking one question, which I'll, I'll continue to pose to myself, my students and, and colleagues, and of course I'll, I'll like to pose it for all of us, is what makes an instrument? What is an instrument? Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of different answers to this, and I think each person may actually, in fact, have their own answer to this, just like the question, what is music? But one thing I would offer is this, you know, I mean, you can have you know, one seven, 17, 15 Stradivarius violin. That's one of the more, most sophisticated, you know, commonly regarded as, you know, one of the best instruments ever made. But in some sense, it's just a wooden box. That is, until you put it in the hands of someone who has the will to express with it. But you can say that about anything. You can say, hey, here's a tin can and some, some sticks. Go make music, and I bet someone can actually make beautiful music with that. And I think maybe if I want to make a point here is that perhaps, at least to me, an instrument is, is something with which you can be expressive sonically. And once you can be expressive, you have the beginnings and the possibility to make music. And that is when something becomes an instrument. And in that sense, there's no difference between the Stradivarius and the sticks and the tin can. And why not with these powerful computers that we now have in our pockets and we actually have with us at all times? 
Um, there's another idea I want to throw out before I get into the apps, is that there's a certain idea that you know, technology shouldn't really be in the foreground. Technology has always been here to help us do what we want to do. It's not here because we're, that's not our goal. Our goal is never, hey, we're here for technology, all oh, right. And but it's, what can technology do for us? And along that is this idea that technology perhaps should create calm. This is an idea that some 20 years ago was forwarded by the fathers of ubiquitous computing. They're the ones that 20 years ago, that's a long freaking time in computer, you know, computer time. Um, and they thought you know, we'd actually have these devices that go with us, but they're also going to be invisible. They're going to be pervasive, ubiquitous, but more and more so less aware and that we need to be less aware of technology to make use of it as time goes on. Um, at the same time, is that technology should create calm and recede into the background of our lives. And I'm not sure to what extent that's happening, but I think in some deep way it actually is, is that we don't really need to know how these phones actually work in order to just do stuff with them. iPads and iPhones, they don't, they don't come with manuals. You can put them in the hands of a, like a two-week-old infant or in the hands of a 90-year-old person who have never used a computer before. And both of those users has a really great chance to start using the thing. And I think that is at least maybe one more step inside for computing where we no longer have to worry so much about how computer works, but simply figure out what we want to do with them. And um, what I want to do with them is just to make, make music, but more so to get a lot of people, everyone, to make music. I feel like the musicians already know they want to make music. So that's really not who I'm really after. I'm after everyone else. I think music is the killer app for humanity and has been for thousands of years. It's something that pervades every culture. Music is something that's truly universal to, to us as human beings. So we figure there's something that we can marry with that and the fact that these devices are in the hands of hundreds of millions of people. Um, you know, wonder what new possibilities there are. So, so with that, we, you know, uh, we started our mobile phone orchestra at Stanford, but also in summer 2008, uh, started Smule. And uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of things. This is the Ocarina, which we talked about. And uh, I'm going to plug here. That's the Ocarina. And uh, it's modeled after kind of the four hole English pendant Ocarina. And, but it's something of a physical instrument. Let's see. Do the, uh, now I've got to do the laptop here. What's the other one? Um, and using multi-touch screen to, to, to press the finger holes, you're actually blowing into the microphone located at the bottom of the iPhone here. Accelerometer is mapped to vibrato, so. So you get three very physical interactions here. Um, and uh, let, me, let me play a little ditty here. I'm going to play two. One is a... Uh, One's the piece I started, I've been playing um, on Ocarina for, for a couple of years now. It's the reason why Ocarina was kind of, well, it was at least the reason why I felt comfortable putting Ocarina out there as a product, wondering if anyone would know what the hell an Ocarina is. But through a wonderful video game called The Legend of Zelda, The Ocarina of Time, um, we, we, we thought, hey, you know, people might know what that, what that is. Legend of Zelda. I'm going to play you one more, and uh, 
And this one is a, is a melody I, I love so much, and uh, it's actually a, it's from the Beijing Olympics. So this is you and me, and I thought I'd play you a little bit out here. for to sing along. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, applaud. Good job singing. <laughs> so that's the ocarina, but that's just one half of the ocarina. Um, there's actually a social component to the ocarina. Um, Black Cool Cat from, looks like, is that Korea? This is a feature that allows you to listen in and other people play their iPhone ocarinas. Let's just go around the world here. Let's see. Literally, we've just hit three continents here. This actually may be coming from around here, actually. This isn't perfectly live. It could be anywhere time of a few seconds ago to a few hours ago. Um, yeah, it's actually GPS. So we actually upload the location data when you're actually playing. And uh, you, you can give yourself a name. And all the other dots on here are where people recently have played. So you can see all the places in China people have been playing. Uh, Hong Kong looks like a lot of players there. Uh, a lot of players in Europe. And uh, a lot of players in the US. Um, and I guess that's Greenland, so that doesn't really, doesn't really count. I thought there was a lot of players up there, but no. <laughs> That would be really fun, wouldn't it? If you get like, we are the world. We are the world. You can get like a hundred thousand people playing ocarina together. We'll, uh, we're working on it. <laughs> so this is the, this is kind of you know ocarina, and um, I'm just gonna, it's gonna keep going because there's people have listened to each other some forty million times, much more than that actually by now, um, and uh, and I think that's what I mean is that well technology. Is, when you think, look at that, the first thing you think about shouldn't be, like, that's cool technology. It should be, oh, that's somebody somewhere out there doing something with their iPhone. That's kind of cool. You know, so who's that person? You, yeah, you start asking these questions that need no answers. If you hear Final Countdown being played from, like, <laughs> Shanghai, it'd be like, you know, you'd, you'd be like, who is that? Is that, you know, is that a popular tune there? Or is there a traveler there? You know, so... Um, there's a certain visceral, I think, connection that can be made through what we do with technology that doesn't need to be about the technology. Um, but yet, technology is central to what we do, of course. And we, when we designed the Ocarina, you know, we kind of did it backwards. Um, I kind of call it inside-out design, where we actually look at the very platform and technology we're using and design backwards from asking what is good about it that we can use. Um, Users have actually, you know, there are millions of users of Ocarina now, and, uh, and as far as we can tell, most of them are not quote unquote musicians. They're simply everyday people who like music. And that is the goal to get everyone making music. Um, and I just want to show you one um, comment that was left in iTunes. Um, it says, This is my piece on Earth. It's from a deployed U.S. soldier. Uh, this is from like two years ago. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on earth is an everyday occurrence. 
a few nights you may have off. I am deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature lets you hear everybody else in the world playing the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It's the exact opposite of my life. Um, when you see a comment like that, and you know, it's like, wow, okay, we're not, you know, we're not worthy. And also, I feel very thankful to be a software person because I feel like it, you know, it's there are people risking their lives every day out there. And uh, also, software development is, by 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 contrast, a much, you know, easier thing. So um, it's a very humbling thing to actually see see something like this. And it keeps us going, inspires us to keep going, and inspires a lot of other people too. And uh, so on YouTube, there are thousands of users um, actually performing for the world through Ocarina. I'll show you one of them here. Let's see, I need to plug it here. Yes, she's playing, playing this through her nose. Um, so she's actually a, um, apparently a lifelong nose flautist. She's been playing various flutes with her nose for like all her life. And this is just like another flute that she's gonna play with her nose. So it's the music of the night or maybe music of the nose. We, it was actually part of this contest we did. Um, it's called the Ocarina This Contest Blows video contest. And she was one of the 15 winners. We sent all the winners like $1,000 in a t-shirt for her. We also sent her a box of Kleenex. Um, <laughs> so uh, a couple more things I just want to share with you. Um, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the very fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. And this is again by Mark Wise, one of the fathers of ubiquitous computing. And we've kind of taken this idea and made instruments, actually not an instrument, made a kind of what we call a meta instrument. This is an instrument with which you can make instruments. Everyone can. And you can make it from the elements of everyday life. Let me show you. It's called MadPad. So you get the idea. So this is um, so that's MadPad. Um, another instrument uh, we're making. Also, that's the one kind of instrument where the idea is to make instruments. And to date, users have taken you know to literally to the streets again with this instrument. They've made instruments out of their pets, their roommates, their appliances, their homes their vehicles and actually also actual musical instruments. They've kind of made meta musical instruments in that sense as well. Um, we've also tried to create other types of experiences um, based on more traditional instruments such as the piano and uh, that was actually made with Long Long and also uh, uh, a magic fiddle. Um, I do want to show you a little bit of the, the magic piano here in this in this promotional video here. So dots fall, and you just gotta catch them. And the timing, the expressiveness of that is up to you. It's actually behind, uh, behind Stanford in the foothills. I had this imagery of just frolicking with iPhones in your hand running around. <laughs> in the beginning I warned you I would subject you to some things and this is one of them. So uh, 
The idea here is that the notes are actually baked in, but it's up to you to express and bring out the flavor of these notes. And uh, I'll just let this finish, just to complete the, this horrible gesture. And it also has a good message at the end. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's the magic piano. I just want to wrap up with, with two things. One is uh, then we made things uh, to get people to be creative with their voice. And we, this one, we made the magic piano with Long Long. We made this app with T-Pain. And uh, maybe the best way to show you is just to, after that video, I feel like I can't really embarrass myself too much more, so I'm just going to just go for it. Um, T-Pain is an app, uh, I am T-Pain is an app that allows you to uh, basically auto-tune your voice. Um, no matter what you think about auto-tune, it has this undeniable uh, charm to it. Yeah, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, well, let me, uh, let, me, let, me, let me sing you something. <clears throat> Beware. Apologies in advance. Shorty! Yeah, yeah, yeah. La la Now think it's do yourself. You can do it all by yourself. Baby girl, what's your name? Let me talk to you. Buy you a drink. I'm T Pain. You know me. Convict music, not before. Ooh, we know the club. Close that key. What's the chance of you rolling with me? Back to the crib, show you how I live. Let's get drunk, forget what we did. Can I buy you a drink? Oh, whoa! Okay, so, all right. So. Ah, <laughs> uh, so I don't feel very comfortable singing, but with auto tune, I feel expressive. <laughs> so, um, so there you go. Um, and our users have done the same. And I think the users, really, this is a very people-powered uh, endeavor, um, which makes me think that this would be especially cool in China. Um, in any case, here are some users literally taking to the streets once again to make music. I'm going to show you one of them. Actually, I'm going to show you the lyrics to one of them. This is only to warn you that there's going to be a lot of bad words coming up. <laughs> this is the winner of our T-Pain video contest. And I'll just read you the first part. I take a picture click on my phone expellative. I send the expellative to your phone because I got MMS, I got Safari Sun, I got that Google Maps. They call me Steve Jobs because I got so many apps. Okay, so let me just play you a little bit of the video here. And this is actually written and produced, whoops, written and produced by, um, by the users. And they... Dead. Yeah, it's sick. Dude, I am TV. <laughs> it's called I'm on a phone. <laughs> it's about being on a phone. Just some motherfucker. Hey, boss, you can see. 
All right, you get the idea. So, <laughs> so for better or for worse, um, that is part of our future. And uh, I think it's, it's the user, it's them being expressive, and uh, we, we don't, we just want people to be expressive in whatever way they want to be expressive. So um, um, I'll end with one last note. And uh, this is an example from a different app we've made called Glee. And uh, in, in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami disasters in Japan, uh, a woman started a version of Lean on Me in Tokyo and started inviting her friends to join. And this kind of snowballed and where hundreds of people started joining in on the same performance. With the app, you can actually add your voice to any existing performance. And to date, there are more than 4,000 voices on this one rendition of Lean On Me. And, you, and this is something you really don't need an explanation for why, for why, that's, you know, why that song is, is important and what the meaning of it is. And technology is certainly nowhere in the picture. It's all about people getting together. This is actually the connection. You can see all the different lines converging on, uh, on Tokyo and Japan here. And those are coming from locations where people around the world have added their voice. So uh, I'll just show you what I sound like at around a thousand voices. So with that, I just wanted to leave you guys with, uh, with an invitation to continue making music, being expressive, and, uh, and also invite you to think about you know, kind of what, what the future of music making might be once we can add this component of really connecting people through these communication devices we already have. And I wonder what kind of new musics can be made. Are there going to be cool, you know, cool, crazy, anonymous, stranger choirs of like a million people singing together? Are there new instruments, new ways to compose music in ways that would involve all the people around the world, but in still, very, you know, still in a very meaningful way? Um, so I think we're at a very exciting time when things are changing and changing ever faster. So um, we seem to be just at the beginning of this adventure, and I just want to say and invite you all to, to join in. So with that, thank you all very much. <laughs>